guys, welcome back to Dracula Love Story. Um, I'm actually excited to play this this time. <laughs> Even though I'm, I'm a little nervous because we all know how it ended last time with her kind of coming into her own a little bit and then she discovers that Dracula may or may not, Vlad, may or may not have uh, murdered Greatish in the forest. Um, so we'll see how that goes and... Um, Hopefully, she pulls her head out of her butt and um, <laughs> we can get things going. Um, looking at my points here, I'm on the luck path. I think once I finish season one, I might want to go back and play the bravery path. People said she's a, she has a little bit more, a little more umph, a little more character on the bravery path. So I think I might try that instead. But for now, let's go ahead and play this. Hopefully, she... She continues on with her, you know, finally becoming a character <laughs> sort of deal. Um, oh boy. Let's see how she handles the situation. Okay, right back into the thick of it. Okay, chapter 11, Liberation. Melody. Leo's hand grabbed me and pulled me aside. We both fell. I lay with my cheek on the grass and watched me hide disappear back into the thicket. Chilling cold, so uncharacteristic for summer, was radiating from the forest ground, binding my body. But I didn't move. The strange, unbearable feeling was still burning in my chest. Pain from the loss of beloved people and the betrayal of someone seemingly trustworthy. What betrayal? I was about to say. <laughs> I know she was talking about Vlad betrayed her. It was Vlad's pain, and it left me in no doubt as to what happened to Greatish. He, m but I couldn't utter utter the sentence even in my mind. Melody, are you okay? Are you hurt? Leo took my hand and helped me up. For God's sake, why did you run here? What if I wasn't on time? Tell me, why did you go into the forest? I saw the body on the ground again. The scream echoed through my mind. I gave a start. Leo, Greatish is lying in blood back there, and Vlad was next to him. What? We ran through the forest, slipping and getting scratches from the branches again. Y'all going back in? Or y'all going out? What? What is that sticky stuff? My feet got into something viscous and slid to the side. Be careful. I looked down and saw the thick sludge of the gray swamp, and not only on the ground. Gross tendrils were twirling around the bushes and branches everywhere the eye could see. Somewhere behind the trees, we heard rustling and whispers, rolling like a wave, now close, now far. That sounds scared the bejesus out of me. Sorry. <laughs> I thought someone was in the room. Oh. This again? But there was no time to think about it. We were already running on. Finally, we saw the clearing. Okay, they're running back to the cap. Oh, no. They're going back there. The castle owner was kneeling beside the motionless body. His hand hung in the air for a moment and then touched the shoulder of the laying man. Vlad's pale face writhed as if it were in unbearable pain. No. Vlad? What's wrong with him? Leo rushed to Greatish and leaned over his body. Mr. Greatish? Mr. But there was no answer. Crimson, sticky fluid was covering the grass around his body. What do I do? Um. That sounds like a lot of accusing, and we don't really know what happened. He, he probably murdered him. I'm just going to say it. But I don't care. <laughs> um, let's ask him cautiously. I'm not going to check on Grace because I don't care about Greatish. Once again. Still on the luck path. <laughs> Maybe I don't like the bravery path. I don't know. I don't know what she would have said. 
But usually, like, if you say something like that, then they, like, they get, like, really irate and it's, like, really obnoxious with it. I don't know. Slowly, cautiously, I approached them. Vlad, what happened here? Please tell me. He looked at me with deep anguish and despair. His hands were shaking slightly. I didn't want to. Okay, so he did. Suddenly, he fell silent. His face lit up with determination. Maybe it's not too late. He bent down to the body, turned it around, and started lifting it up. Not too late to what? Grinch's suit jacket was cut open on his chest, and below, there was a bleeding wound. Leo took to helping Vlad hastily. Together, they lifted the man and carried him toward the castle walls. Trying my best to contain a surge of panic, I rushed after them. Okay. Okay. I can deal with this. We need to call a rescue services now. As if answering his words, sirens welled somewhere close to us. The bright lights cut through the darkness of the forest, making the leaves light up with colorful reflections. We walked to the castle, and a police car rode up at the same moment, followed by an ambulance. What are they doing here? People in uniform rushed out of the car, shouting orders. Several paramedics took Gradish and carried him to the ambulance. Finally, the siren died down, but the strobe lights continued spinning, blinding us. Leo, Vlad, and I were facing three policemen. Officer, we found him in the forest about 200 feet from here, and we saw a man. He probably didn't go far. Wow. Chief Officer immediately said something in Romanian to his colleagues. They shared an anxious look, but didn't dare oppose him and went into the forest. We've got a call from a man half an hour ago telling us there will be a murder here. Bitch ass Noe! Motherfucking bitch! Oh my god! I can't stand his ass! See, I knew something seemed super sketch about that. Like, someone adding up. Like, fucking no way, dude. I. Mmm. He's such a pathetic coward. He's so pathetic. It's just ridiculous. Because he doesn't believe that love is real or something like that. That is so pathetic. That is so pathetic. Like,. <laughs> Was it one of you? We shared a look and shook our heads. The policeman frowned. Then what were you doing there? Um, we live here? What do I do? Talk first, let Leo tell the story, ask Vlad to tell the story. Who would be good at talking? I feel like Leo would be good at talking. Is this a relationship thing? This might be like bravery or something. Are we building anything else like glory or anything? Like, no, it's like a soul light. That's a back to Vlad to tell it. I feel like he has the most information about the area, maybe? Okay, that's luck. Let Vlad tell it. When I ran to the screens, he was already there. I looked at the castle owner, he glanced at me and turned to the officer. I don't know what happened. But you were the first to have found the body. Probably. The officer gave him a close look and touched the handcuffs on his belt. I think Mihai was the first one. Mihai? Who's that? Maybe I should let Leo talk. <laughs> Vlad is kind of like, uh, yeah, whatever. Okay. <laughs> the father of our friend, Sandra, he lives in a village nearby. The other day he attacked his daughter in our presence. He was clearly out of his mind. I don't think it's an accident he was here when the attack happened. Mihai? Her father was here? Sandra was standing several feet from us with her face as pale as a sheet. We heard screams in Romania and the sounds of fierce fighting from behind the trees. That's my father's voice. Oh, that don't look good. The chief officer grabbed his weapon and rushed to the thicket. Leo followed him. Sandra rushed after them, but I hugged her, not letting her go. Sweetheart, don't. He almost killed you the last time. The deafening sound of a shot echoed through the air. We heard more screams and scuffles. Soon the policeman and Leo walked out of the forest, dragging me high. The left part of his chest was covered in blood and he was gasping for air. What did you do to him? I'm sorry, miss. He snatched a gun from the sergeant and shot himself in the heart. Sandra turned to Leo with her eyes full of terror. It's true, Sandra. I saw it. She fell to her knees next to her father and spoke in a broken voice.
Mihai closed his eyes. The paramedics ran to him and scurried about, then carried him to the ambulance. What, oh, the ambulance is still here? Tell me they brought more than one, right? If they're gonna save Gradish. Not that we care about Gradish for a long time. Sandra stayed at the clearing, watching them. She pressed her fist to her lips, and tears streamed down her face. I hugged her and caressed her hair. Leo approached us, whispering some words of consolation. I noticed Vlad looking at us, and that's when it hit me. The unbearable feeling in my chest was gone. Vlad's plane wasn't there anymore. I was wrong. He didn't hurt Gritish. Now I'm sure Mihai did. Despite the horror of these events, my heart pounded happily in my chest. Vlad has nothing to do with it. He's not a murderer. I mean, it was kind of stupid of you to assume that right away anyway. I mean, like, okay. Some surrounding facts kind of suggest that, but I don't know. She hasn't been paying attention to any surrounding facts anyway, and suddenly she wants to be a detective. <laughs> it's like, mm. <laughs> I gotta give her a break. I really do. I got to. I swear. I felt painfully awkward for my suspicions. I looked at him. You want to come closer, be with us, support Sandra. Why aren't you coming? But he just remained still, not saying a word. I got so lost in my emotions that I didn't dare call him. Ladies, gentlemen, take a look here. Do you know this number? Chief officer approached us, showing us a piece of paper with some digits. Sandra wiped her eyes with her hand and looked at it. This is my father's mobile number. Where did you get it? Oh, it was he the one who called and said there would be a murder? It was a number someone called us from to report a murder. I still blame Noe. I still do. <laughs> what? Yeah, and one more thing. This object. Has any of you seen it before? Is it the uh, sickle? The officer nodded his assistant. He shows a clear sealed bag. Inside there was a bloody sickle. Sandra and I shared a look. Y yes, we saw a very similar one recently at my father's house. I see. It's a rather peculiar thing. You don't come across something like this often. My guys found it in the bushes where Gradish was attacked. This is the apparent weapon for the attack. One of the doctors emerged from the ambulance and the policeman went to talk to him. So it was him. Father attacked Gradish. But before he did, he called the police and warned them for some reason. Like he wasn't in control. He definitely felt like he's being possessed. I don't understand. Why would he do that? I asked him just now when we were talking. He said, I didn't want to. He made me do it. He? That's when the officer returned to us. They both, Greatest died back in the forest. Mihai passed several minutes ago. My condolences, miss. After the interrogation, Sandra and I were allowed to return to the castle. We stopped in the lobby. I didn't want to leave her alone. Do you want to come to my room? Thank you, Melody, but I need to be alone for a while. Just sort out my thoughts. And I want to call my sister and tell her. I hugged her. Just know that I'm here, in your corner. Call me whenever you need me. Huh. I stood under the hot shower for a long time, trying to wash off the bitter aftertaste of the evening, but failing. Death, death again. It hurts so much and so strange. I doubt behind you, Gradish. What was the point of attacking him then? But what if he came after Sandra again, and Gradish just happened to be there? That thought sent an unpleasant shiver down my body. And Vlad, I wanted to talk to him, but you didn't. If they're back, I might still catch him. I should go check. But first, I need to get dressed. What's he like? It's like he's trying to play detective, but like. <laughs> She completely disregarded the he part of someone told him to do that. It's like that wasn't in her discussion at all. And I'm not sure why it's very strange. and brush my hair. Mm. 
The moment I left my room, I saw the policeman in the lobby. They were talking to John, and Vlad was standing several feet from them. John? Who's John? <laughs> One of people who work here, right? Oh, that guy. Yes, I know there's only one road, and still, we couldn't leave. It's like this damn forest is enchanted. You end up in the same place wherever you go. John fixed his clothes nervously. The chief officer was eyeing him with cold suspicion. But, I thought they found... Oh, they want to know if he was in cahoots with the killer? His two colleagues talked to him in Romanian, nervous and a bit embarrassed. The officer made a wry face. Stop telling me these fairy tales. Do you want us to write about supernatural nonsense in our report? It's just a normal forest, and today we found the reason for dis people disappearing in it. That maniac must have been hunting there for a while. Who knows how many he had killed? The officer rubbed his forehead wearily. All right, of course. We'll look into it, even though it's all clear to me. It was just another nutcase. Let's go. That's enough for today. Everyone said their goodbyes. Vlad walked down the hallway immediately, and the policeman turned to the exit. John followed the policeman, but then noticed me and lingered behind. Miss Melanie, if you recall, I warned you, and for a reason. Beware of these paintings and this place. I don't think all these weird things can be explained by just one psycho. Goodbye. He nodded at me and walked to the door briskly. I was alone in the lobby thinking about everything I just heard, then the front door opened again. Valentine walked in, followed by Millie, who was carrying Gradish's cat. My poor girl, don't be afraid. We'll go to my room and I'll take care of you. It's good that you weren't eaten by animals in this creepy forest. Millie, what were you doing outside at this hour? I thought you fell asleep hours ago. Sure, as if I could fall asleep. Sirens, ambulances, police. It all, it all uh, could wake up corpse up. And apparently, there really are corpses. I still was my mouth agape, not sure what to say. Yes, I know everything already. It's so unfortunate. I feel sorry for Grady. She seemed like a nice dude who loved animals, but most of all, I feel sorry for Sandra. Yeah. But everyone forgot about Gardenia with all this fuss. It's a good thing she came back on her own. On her own? The cat uh, run and hide in the kitchen. Hiss at me, bit me. I couldn't take it. Oh, thanks to Miss Millie, she helped me. Oh. Millie still. Um. Good on you for taking care of her. Everyone really forgot about her, but now the little baby is safe with you. My sister smiled with joy and slight embarrassment. Just to really appreciate your words. She turned around, trying to hide her smile. All right, I need to take care of Gardenia. Good night. Millie left. Valentine was also about to go when I stopped him. I need to talk to your master. Do you know where to find him? Well, if you had... <laughs> Why did she get distracted? Uh, let's go. Have we been here before? I pushed the door Valentine showed me and ended up in the room with the big clock. I guess it's the room Leo mentioned. Oh, okay. Well, I was facing away from the door with his head up, watching the moonlight uh, seep through the stained glass. Against the tall walls of the empty chamber, his figure looked so alone in the cold blue light. I saw the images from the past, Lil laughing and young Vlad smiling. My chest ached. Could it really be us? The closest of friends, almost family? There was no logical explanation, but that's how I felt. Vlad turned around, his dark face lit up with surprise and joy. Melody? You're here. He smiled, just for me, but I can hear it in his voice. He wasn't thinking about happy things. All the emotions I've been holding up for so long toward him suddenly rose up, threatening to come pouring out. It's all so stupid, all this resentment, this avoidance. He feels bad, I feel bad, and all for what? I felt like making things clear and taking down the wall between us immediately. I took a decisive step towards him. Vlad, tell me the truth. Are you Dracula? His face went pale. He clenched his fingers into a fist. Your ancestor who built this castle, that was his name, right? Your descendant of the Valahia ruler, Vlad Dracula? He caught his breath, his fist unclenched slowly. Yes, Melody. It's the name of our bloodline. It was my father's. And it's mine. He fell silent, looking at me expectantly. What about your reaction to Gradus? Your burst of fury? Is it because of the long view between your families? He shook his head barely noticeably. Gradus just a descendant. He had nothing to do with it. I had no reasons for behaving the way I did. 
It's just my problem. He was a descendant of those people who pretend to be friends and then sentenced your ancestor to death, turning them into, the, into their enemies. I'm not making excuses for your behavior, but I think you had your reasons. I took a step closer. Vlad, I know your family name has strange connotations today, and it's not something you can tell everyone. But it doesn't matter at all what kind of family you come from, what was in the past. The only important thing is what kind of person you are. He looked at me with unblinking eyes full of grief. Besides, it only takes a bit of research to understand. That all the legends about Vlad the Third being a heartless monster mostly lie. He was just protecting his people all the ways he could. I read about him a lot before going to Romania. I can't believe I didn't figure out whose castle it was right away. I guess the whirlwind of events didn't let me. Or is he being stupid though, whatever. And sometimes, the more obvious the truth, the harder it is to accept. Yes. All knowledge comes in due time, when you're ready to accept it. I wanted to ask him about the paintings, the strange forest, and the reason he took me to the castle. But something inside was telling me I shouldn't hurry. Give him time. You can't make a person confide in you. What it takes is showing you're ready to listen. Vlad, I want you to know I'm not judging you. We all make mistakes and let our emotions take over. His gaze softened a bit. I know, Melody. Let's go, it's too cold for you here. Okay. I feel like we're making some progress. Finally. <laughs> we ended up by my doorway too fast. We both froze by the entrance, looking at each other. Your relationship with Vlad is good enough. Seconds were passing, the pause was drawing long, becoming way too telltale. But I couldn't bear to say goodbye. This conversation wasn't enough for me. I didn't have enough of him. I don't want to leave. Why should I? Suddenly Vlad said, The Book of Romania myths. You took it in the library. Do you still have it? Yes. What piqued your interest in it? I peaked. Piked. I don't know. A legend called... Mistrumental. Do you know what it's about? Vlad frowned slightly. Master Builder Manol is a ballad about an architect who wanted to build the best cathedral in the world, but he had to make a horrible sacrifice for it. He had to brick in a living person to the wall at the foundation. What? Ooh. But there are plenty of other stories in the book, happier ones. If you feel like it, we can take it and go to my room. We can sit by the fire and read. Ooh, to Vlad's room. Um, let's go. <laughs> oh, he has a little gingerbread man. <laughs> it looks so cozy in here. Oh, look at the fluffy rug. Yeah, be careful with the, the embers. <laughs> Vlad opened the uh, door. He then, um, your relationship with Vlad improved. He then led me into a spacious room submerged in mysterious duskiness. I like how, like, the choices in this one, they don't let you know right away. Like, if you've chosen something you want, they, like, delay it for a second. You're like, wait, did that do anything? <laughs> the fireplace was the heart of the room. The tongues of the fire were fighting furiously, one moment rushing at each other, the next biting into the logs. I froze, unable to look away. The fireplace was scaring me with its heat and living aggression, but at the same time, its warmth and light were beckoning me. <laughs> I'd like you to feel free here. I looked at Vlad and noticed with surprise that he was changing before my eyes. The sadness and fatigue of the last days were disappearing quickly, replaced by a calm strength, some sort of powerful inner energy. He's coming back, the real Vlad. Oh, how I like him this way. There was a hint of a smile in his gaze on me. I looked away, took off my shoes off, and walked to the fireplace, extending my palms towards it. I'd like you to feel free as well. For example, you really don't have to wear this suit coat now. He smirked, took his coat off, loosened the neck of his shirt a bit, and rolled his sleeves up. <gasps> Better? <laughs> yes! Go ahead and smell a little more. <laughs> Much better. He came closer and sat the soft pelt by the fireplace. I sat down next to him. For a while, we were looking at the fire silently, dim lights, logs crackling. And Vlad, whose presence I was feeling with every inch of my skin, I looked over his body involuntarily. I was so used to seeing Vlad buttoned up. 
and a slight nonchalance his appearance seemed defiantly seducing to me now, especially the naked part of his arm under the loosely rolled sleeve. Suddenly, my palm slid closer to his across the soft fur. My fingers touched his wrist and got higher slowly, touching him with only the fingertips. His stand started but froze immediately, letting me caress it. Painful tension flickered in Vlad's face for a brief moment, but I noticed it and jerked my hand away immediately. Suddenly, I knew. The touches pain him. They always have, ever since we first met at the hotel bar. Vlad, you... Can I touch me? I can. Yes, but through pain? How come I've been so blind and oblivious until now? Hallelujah! <laughs> okay. Jeez! Finally! She's becoming a character. I like this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> he turned away looking at the flames. I'm a very strange person, Melody. I've got serious issues, and this is one of them. An ability to touch other people? Is it some kind of phobia? Though, wait, you touched Millie just fine, and Leo. Everyone. Except for me. Yes, because you're not like everyone. I paused to think, deciding whether I should take what he said as a compliment or not. <laughs> There's a lot of light in you. A special light. So light! And my darkness is too black. Your light and my darkness, those two cannot touch. What? I don't understand. It's too early. You'll understand a bit later on. But is there a way of doing something about it? Some sort of therapy? He smirked bitterly and looked me in the eye again. There is, but not now. It takes time. Melody, I'm sorry for trying to become closer to you, to ignite feelings in you. Truth be told, I have nothing to give you in return. Only my heart torn to pieces and a whole lot of trouble. You see what's already happening, and it can be even worse. For your own good, I should have disappeared from your life, but I cannot. Yes, I'm the worst of those I could imagine next to you, but I want to be the one. I'm sorry. Does his hands seem like very pale? Like, besides his skin up here? I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the selfishness, for asking you to trust me when even I don't trust myself. I was looking at him with increasing perplexity. He noticed it and moved away a bit. If you want to leave now, I understand. No, nah, I'm going. You're always trying to protect me in any situation. And not just me, but Sandra and Millie as well, even Leo. And I can't say you started on friendly terms. It's easy to be good when you're carefree. It's much harder to keep the light when the darkness is eating you from the inside. But you do it. You became even closer to black. I raised my hand to his face and hovered it by his cheek for a moment, and then pulled away. And the fact we can't touch, let it be. He kept silent, watching me tenderly and attentively, as if he couldn't get enough of me. I couldn't look away from him either, feeling the blue of his eyes pull me in, and I couldn't hope to return. Then something snapped inside me and I saw clearly. Right now, a person I've been waiting for all my life, even without knowing it, is sitting in front of me. And I've missed him so much. That's when I heard his voice. You know, I've missed you so much. Just several words uttered calmly and simply without any anguish. But I felt as if a powerful force caught me, tore me from the ground, shook me in the air, and left me floating. I gasped for air and whispered quietly, so did I. He smiled. He leaned closer to me and blew the locks of hair, um, my hair off my forehead softly. For a moment, Vlad froze, taking my smell in. It was so close that I felt the warmth, the energy of his body. I felt all of him. He pulled back a bit and looked me in the eye again. So it's a good thing we met. My head spun. My lungs were giving me just tiny bits of air, making me breathe fast and shallow. And Vlad kept looking at me. His gaze spoke more than the most straightforward words could. It was telling me how much he liked to press me closer, cover me in kisses, hold me. How he would caress my body, study its curves, feel its shiver under his fingers. How he liked to have all of me, unreservedly, and how he already does in his thoughts. My body was answering with sparks of warmth to each sparkle in his eyes and saying yes to all his wishes in advance. Oh.
If someone was filming us in that moment, there would just be two silhouettes opposite each other in the frame. So modest and innocent. But if that camera could show our thoughts... <laughs> Whoa! Okay! <laughs> there would be two entangled bodies, unable to have enough of each other. At some point, the tension grew too strong. I couldn't bear it and I looked away. Sadness came, squeezing my heart. I reached for the book to chase it away. We wanted to read? Vlad smiled, took the anthology from me, and opened the index. I'd like to read you a fairy tale about a beautiful young man named Fat Frumis who was searching for the stolen sun. We made ourselves comfortable at the pelt, reclining on it, and he started reading. Back in the old times when people existed only in the grains of the future, Vlad was reading fragments in Romanian and then translating and explaining them. He was very talented, talented and eloquent at it. I was listening to his velvety voice, watching the movement of his lips, catching all of his emotions, and it kept submerging into the atmosphere of the fairy tale, not only in the story, but also in reality. At some point, I felt so safe and cozy that I fell asleep, right next to the fireplace on the pelt, accompanied by the sound of his voice. I felt the specks of sunshine on my eyelids and opened my eyes. I found myself where I was by the fireplace. My body was covered with a light blanket. Good morning. <laughs> you look so bright and happy. <laughs> Vlad was standing by the window and his face was lit up by the rays of the morning sun. Apparently my reading makes the best so horrific. I smiled embarrassedly, <laughs> got up and started fixing my clothes. I'm sorry, you were reading beautifully. I was just too tired. I'm kidding. I should be the one to apologize. It's not the most comfortable place to sleep. But you were sleeping so blissfully, I didn't want to wake you up. Someone knocked on the door. Vlad and I shared a look. I thought I had nothing to hide or no reason to hide myself. I guess it's Valentine. Will you let him in? It was indeed Valentine. The butler added something about coffee, but then noticed me and looked away bashfully. <laughs> Miss Melody, Miss Sandra looked for you. I remembered I promised Sandra to be there for her when she needed me, so I said goodbye to Vlad and ran to our rooms. <clears throat> Sandra was still in the hallway. Hey, I'm here. How are you? I'm fine. It was clear that she'd been up all night, but her face was decisive now. Melody, I want to go to my father's meal. Right now in the morning, while the cops aren't there, will you come with me? I agreed immediately. We warned Valentine and soon drove out of the castle. <laughs> the meal was at the outskirts between the cold village and the cold forest. It's very old, but father was taking care of it, so it's perfectly fine. Sandra looked pensive. What do you want to find here? I don't know, but I must understand father's motives. Sandra. You're right, we need to act. Now I'm doing bravery. <laughs> I heard the policeman's conversation last night. They said it was pretty clear to them that he was just a lunatic. Yes, I understood. They won't look into this case, so we'll do it. I agree. The mill was his second, if not first, home. I think he loved it more than he loved us. If there are answers, they're here. Oh, whoops. Hmm. I want to get to the bottom of who's pulling the strings. And until proven innocent, I'm blaming Noe for everything. <laughs> or possible reincarnated Mehmed. Huh. We also don't know what happened to Hassan after all this time. We had a relationship something boost in the beginning. They never, they never went back on that, but... Maybe that shadowy figure that's uh that was like in the first episode. Maybe that's a son. I don't know. Sandra and I went inside, crossed the big room on the lower floor, and got to a tiny room upstairs. Ow. This is his domain. Let's take a look. The room looked dark and not very tidy. 
Everywhere we could see, there were old magazines, instruments, and work appliances. Sandra took to examining the space. I decided to stay out of her way and took the nearest magazine from the table. It was an old atlas of Romanian towns. Interesting. I thumbed the pages, yellowed from time, and suddenly saw a familiar name. Razov. That is familiar. I don't remember from what, though. In the lower corner, there was an inscription someone wrote with a pencil, the street name and a house number. I knew that address. It was the Museum of Brazov. Sandra. Sandra ran to me and examined the page closely. It's his handwriting. He wrote down the museum address. Was Mihai interested in art? Sandra only snorted back. No. Father and art were on different planets. She walked to a cl closet briskly and came back with a heavy notebook. Did he happen to come in touch with one of the paintings, perhaps, per chance? All right, when did you go to Brazov? On the 14th. That's when the custodian was murdered. Oh boy. It's his recordings of clients, who, on which day, and how much of what was mailed. She stopped and pointed to an empty column. There it is, the 14th. Not a single entry he wasn't working that day. And it's midweek in the middle of the season. Father would never let himself rest at a time like that. Sandra, are you thinking? She paced around the room. <laughs> Elinka said that father didn't spend the night at home and came in the morning all morose. You got to browse off approximately about noon. Leo said the blood didn't look fresh, so Bloody could have been laying there since the early morning. The custodian's granddaughter found him when she came to work. But the main thing is the method of killing, so unpractical and atypical. Slashed wounds could be delivered by a sickle. She stopped and run her fingers through her hair. Of course, we'll have to prove it all, but I think it was him. So three attacks? The custodian in Brazov, you at the festival and greatish in the forest. I was just a random link, a witness who could stand in his way. I guess after Brazov, father hid the sickle in the cellar. I took it upstairs and left it in the kitchen. He must have arrived there when we left and figured out we had found the murder weapon. And he knew the person who found it won't stop piece piercing the pieces together and will learn the truth eventually. Are you like that? Oh yeah. In fact, if he hadn't scared me to death that night, that's what I would have done. All right, but we still have the custodian and Greatish. What do they have in common? Sandra and I said it almost simultaneously. The paintings. Yes, the paintings. But a miller killing because of the paintings? That's too strange. Before he died, he told me he didn't want to do it, that he made him do it. I mean, I could have been manipulated into doing it. We heard footsteps from below. Alinka got up to get to us via the stairs. Sandra, you're already here? Have you found anything? We told her everything. She paused thinking about hearing about him. A couple days before my first attack, when Leo and Millie saw me for the first time, a strange man came by our house. He was clearly a foreigner, even though his Romanian was flawless. And he asked me about her grandmother, if I knew what she was doing, if I could do the same. There are a lot of people like him. She was well known for her abilities. People still come. Yeah, so I immediately chased him away like everyone else. I thought he left, but then I saw him talking to Mihai on the road. But Fall didn't speak to his own family, let alone strangers. Yes, but he was standing there listening to the man attentively, and then they left somewhere together. How'd that person look? That's the most interesting part. I remember it was a man, but his appearance was if it were erased from my mind. Sure, I'm not all th I'm not all there, but my memory is just fine. I think he wasn't a commoner. He must have power as well power as well and then could tell her everything the girl looked at me with doubt i can do a lot of things i really inherit our grandma's gift of singing but it's only called a gift in reality it's a heavy cross to bear and i want to live like normal people so i prohibited myself from even thinking about it all ever since i got my power when i was younger but when that man came it all started anew her words made me shiver so alinka's some kind of a witch and some other mage came to visit her until recently, these thoughts would seem somewhat stupid to me, but given the latest events, they didn't look all that weird. Finally. <laughs> so there was someone else after all. Who is he? What did he want? She looked at her sister bashfully. Some kind of mage, huh? I didn't think I'd ever ask you, but can you look it up in your cards? I did, and the result. There's another way, actually, but you won't like it. What is it? Ask the spirits. I can try to summon our grandmother. Sandra slapped her palm on her forehead and shook her head. 
All right, let's try it. Alika turned to me. Melody, do you mind? After all, it looks pretty scary. Oh, no, I am. Yeah, I'm in, man. I don't believe this stuff, but I doubt it'd be worse. You need some proof. <laughs> so you can get with the picture. Alika got a deep dish with water and a needle and a thread. She sat at the table, took the thread by the end, and submerged the needle into the dish so it would float on the water. Sandra and I stepped back to, uh, to the wall just in case. Linka closed her eyes and muttered some words, hovering her hand over the dish. The needle moved suddenly, gliding on the water, then spun like crazy. Then came a hoarse, deep voice. I whispered to Sandra frightenedly, Please translate it all for me. Sandra nodded and Linka gave a start, then froze like a wax doll. Her mouth moved separately from her face as if someone else was guiding it. The voice came again and Sandra whispered the translation to my ear so I understood everything. I'm so glad our gift didn't go to waste. You got it. Your father Mihai was all empty. It was such grief. My only son couldn't see anything. I tried everything I could, but to no avail. What is not has, what is not has nowhere to come from. Before I left, I told him to perform our duty, but what could he do without the power? Do you even know about the duty? I'll tell you, it's yours now. The gift has been in our family for many centuries, and we've never done any harm to people. Unless they asked for it, and they did, they often did. But they never thanked us for help, they just chased us away. People never forgive those who saw how wretched they really are. Alinka's neck went limp, and her head dangled along her shoulders, but she immediately sat straight up, straight as a string. Long time ago, back when Constantinople became Istanbul, our ancestor named Simeon got into trouble. His fellow villagers almost burned him for their own little sins. But their master saved him and dragged him out of the flames. Master? Oh lord. Simeon became his faithful servant then, following him everywhere. And when the master passed, he swore to keep his slumber in the tomb and ordered that, that to his descendants. It's a duty to hide the tomb in the forest, making it invisible to people. And when the master rises, we must serve him as our great-grandfather Simeon did. My head was already spinning from everything I'd heard, but Alinka kept going. But I can't help you with the reason you call for me, little girl. I can only see that your father wanted the power. It's my fault as well. I kept blaming him for having no gift, so he struck a deal with the one who promised it to him. But I cannot figure out who he is. There's a power too strong, too dark, behind it. None of us could ever have dreamt of this power. So it's not the master. So it was somebody else who swooped in, trying to use his family line again. And that's the person separate from the master. Take care of my girl, and take care of the master when needed. So the master, despite sounding kind of evilish, might not actually be evil. You know him. You have seen him in your dreams. So when you see him in reality, know that time is now. Alinka's body convulsed. She went limp and slid down the chair. You've learned important information. Alinka. Sandra and I rushed to her, trying to wake her up. Soon she came to. Oh, did you hear? We did, but we didn't understand a thing. Some duty, a tomb, a master. It's insane. We shouldn't have messed with this. My initial thoughts echoed Sandra, but then... Constantinople became Istanbul in the middle of the 15th century when Vlad Dracula was the ruler here. <clears throat> the tomb in the forest. I've read about it, his tomb, before I came here. Could the master be Vlad's ancestor? Vlad III? And Sandra's ancestor served him? Pieces were seemingly coming together, but it all was too fantastic to believe. So I didn't dare voice my thoughts. Just at least keep thinking of them. I just asked Alinka, did you really see some master in your dreams? Just looked out of the window. It's almost noon. I think we should get going. When we came back to the castle, Sandra and I went to the terrace. Leo, Vlad, and Millie had just finished their breakfast. Valentine was clearing the empty plates. Oh, hey, you're back. We're leaving. Who? Where? 
I'm going to take Grace's cat to his widow. Vlad wanted to come with me. Sarah condolences, maybe offer some help. Vlad looked at him with a hint of reproach in his eyes and added reluctantly, Yes, after all, she's lost her husband. What about your mission? Did you find out anything out? Yes, I think her father was in Brazov the day the custodian was murdered. She told them about her discovery and her suspicions. Fortunately, Sandra didn't mention the summoning of her grandmother's spirit. What do you mean, fortunately? Tell Vlad. <laughs> I'm like, if anybody be able to, like, use that information best, it would be him. Even if you don't understand it, I would tell Vlad anyway. It's not direct proof, of course. But he could have skipped work because of anything. He could have fallen sick. And the museum address, who knows why he was interested in it. Leo's right. There's not enough proof, but your theory sounds quite plausible, Sandra. Do you miss one to eat? No, thanks. I'd rather take a nap. I'm not hungry either. I should get to work. Oh, Lord. Well, since everyone is leaving and all I'm left with is reading, Vlad, where's my book on the Carpathian evil spirits? You promised me you'd give it back. Hell no. Vlad has stayed for a moment, then turned to Valentin. Valentin nodded. The butler nodded again. It's the first time Vlad is speaking to him in Romania in our presence. I wonder what they're talking about. All right, then. Please bring Millie her book. Valentin left and soon returned with the encyclopedia. Millie took it over and turned it over, frowning in surprise. It has a new cover, and it smells so strange. She sniffed the air. Like medicine or herbs. Yes, I asked Valentine to change the cover. The old one was pretty old. It could come apart at any moment. Really? I didn't notice. Alright, thanks. Okay, so something on the cover. Not the book itself. Okay. So he did something to it. Everyone dispersed. When Sandra and I were by our rooms, I asked her. But Vlad and Valentine were talking about the terrace. Vlad asked if Valentine had done what he had ordered him to, and something about goat weed. Goat weed? The plant? Yeah, also I have no clue what it meant, but Vlad was asking if Valentine had found the goat weed, and he said he did. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> I, I took to work as soon as I got into my room. In a couple of hours, I could see not only the little finger, but also the woman's hand and a part of the dress. And soon, I was in the past. Here we go. The events of the past shifted to two years forward and will happen in 1446 from now on. Lel is 16 years old. The jewel dress. Airy dress, a modest dress. Luxuriant locks, dark braids, fair braid, loose hair. I like it. Zero gems, no! Are you ready? Oh, you'd be prettier than the bride. Shut the fuck up, get the fuck out of my face. The tutor is flung up in her hands in delight, examining Lel's gown. I sure won't, Safi's so beautiful and smart. Well, smart girls don't stay single for so long. Everyone was already thinking she'd stay unmarried. She got rid of so many worthy men, and K Khalil Pasha just let her, and the other father. Shut the fuck up. But now she's marrying her beloved Damet. Oh, thank goodness. Yay. How could it be her beloved? She only saw him like two times. Lil bit her lip upon realizing and she almost let out the secret. But he's a nice husband for her, yes. The head of the Sultan's special guard is a high rank. I heard that he made his way to the top from being a simple janissary. The tutor got her shawl and wrapped herself up. Hannah night is an ancient tradition, the last night of the bride in her childhood home before the wedding. Her friends and acquaintances see her off to her new married life. I know that, Shahid Katan. Oh, I'm just reminding you. She looked over Lel again. Look at you, my dear. It's a shame there'll be only women there. Lel frowned and pursed her lips. Shahid Katan, you promised you wouldn't arrange matches for me. The woman shook her head. I was just saying, 
Oh, you and your sharp tongue. Let's go. Don't I have at least enough power to get her replaced? Seriously, because that bitch gotta go. That bitch gotta go. There were already several dozens of women of all ages in the lavishly decorated chamber. The bride was wearing a red bejeweled dress, according to tradition. Look, it's Hun. Welcome. Congratulations. You've finally been together after four years of waiting. Sefi smiled and whispered. It's all thanks to you. All these years, the man was carrying my portrait. It kept him safe in the toughest fights, and it kept our love. I don't think the portrait had anything to do with it, but I'm glad I was helpful to you. New guests arrived, and Safi went to greet them. Hello, darling. How are you? It was the first time Lil saw Nerea ever since she got married and left um, Edirn half a year ago. I'm fine, thanks. How are you? Just wonderful. Nerea smiled, fixing the bell on her cheek, but the smile seemed off to Lil. I'm glad you are. After all, you've always dreamt of marrying a rich nobleman. And your husband's a vizier, and now, as I've heard, he'll be responsible for our culture and education. Yes, Yavuz got appointed, and we moved to the capital. She just so quickly swiped her veil accidentally, and it fell from her cheek. I thought so. Oh, was that an array? It was a big purple bruise on her temple. It's nothing. She lifted the veil back to her face in haste and turned to leave. Tell me what happened. Nori turned around, her eyes watered a bit, and her face was vexed all of a sudden. The flip side of marriage. But you don't have to suffer it. Nori smirked bitterly. What choice do I have? Everyone suffers it, so will I. Don't be in a hurry to get married, Lil. She jerked her hand free and walked to the other side of the room. A traditional rites as a henna night began. The bride's friends were dancing in a ring around her and singing goodbye songs to her, putting coins in her hands, wishing her a witch life. Finally, there was one final rite with Henna. While the preparations for it were underway, an unfamiliar woman approached Lil, looking at her with an intent gaze. So you're Aisha's daughter. It's amazing how your eyes are similar. Okay, it's the first time we've heard about like our parents' name, I think. Lil smiled confusedly. Yes, did you know my mom? Hello, Halim. Halan. What do you want from her? Nothing. I just wanted to meet her. The woman smiled cynically and stepped aside. Who's that? Is that Mehmed's, um... She used to be Sultan Murad's favorite, basically this palace's queen. Yeah, she kind of reminded me of Mehmed. Like, they had a, a similar smirk to them. So that's Mehmed's mother. But... Why does she care about my mom? Now she's no one, just a concubine, forgotten by everyone. I'm so sorry for her. Oh, you shouldn't be. She wasn't sorry for anyone. She was the one who brought your mother to the grave. What? The tutorist caught herself, fell silent, and turned around. Oh, now you ain't got shit to say? This is the only time I want you to talk. Look, they're carrying the henna already. Let's go. Bitch. The servants brought in a big tray. Candles were lit up in the corners of the room, and in the center there was a big pile of greenish powder. The powder was mixed with water, and now there was liquid paste. Tristan says the woman who is the luckiest in her marriage must paint the bride's hands with henna. So that bride would be as lucky as her in marriage she is. It's Nerea Katun tonight. Nerea pressed the tray, took the brush, dipped it in the henna. For a moment she froze, looking at Safi's happy face and put the brush back suddenly. Sorry, I fell under the weather. Let someone else do it. Another girl volunteered and the right concluded. Then it was the bride's turn to paint her friend's hands and Safi called for Lel first. What do you want me to draw? Ooh. Something delicate. Something dainty. Small. Well, I like this hair for a while. That means I won't be able to see the, the tattoo. 
So I might want to get this one. Okay, this one. There, it's almost done. I just need to fix this line. It didn't take color. Safi applied a, a bit of pressure. Crack. A thin brush in her hand broke. Oh, Lord. The chill paper fell silent at once. All the women were looking at Lil in horror. What? Does it mean something? Everyone was sharing looks, but no one spoke. Finally, Shahi Katan waved her hand. What are you staring at? It's nothing special. Let's continue. The woman scurried again, speaking a bit too loudly than they were supposed to. Lil thought the room was going stuffy, so she walked to the exit. A mischievous voice stopped her by the door. A brush broken in this ride is a very bad sign. It means the girl will never get married. Okay. I'm pretty sure I'm gonna die anyway, so. And if someone proposes to her, she'll die the night before her wedding. Okay. I'm pretty sure she's gonna die anyway, so. Lo into the classroom with a pile of drawings and started putting them down on the teacher's table. Several kids, 10 to 12 years of age, were chatting happily and paid her no attention. But one thin boy with a delicate face and pretty wavy hair approached her. Hey there, Radu. How are you doing? Oh, he's cute. Do you need help, Lokatan? He's super cute. Why do I feel... I'm worried about him. I could use some. I need to sort these drawings by thing. Radu took to work eagerly. Lil snuck a couple of peeks at him, barely containing her smile. He's all frowning as a hedgehog, but he's still so beautiful. How are you doing without your brother? Don't you miss him? No. The boy said it too fast and too sharply, and then immediately looked embarrassed. I mean, it's fine. I'm a grown man. I can manage. Grown men can miss someone too, Radu. There's nothing shameful about it. Soon, Aziz Pasha will finish tutoring Vlad and Vlad will be back. Oh, that's Vlad's brother? The boy nodded hesitant. Soon they were done with the drawings and he returned to his friends. Look, Tan, you're so helpful. I can't imagine what we'd do without you. The teacher entered the classroom and the kids went quieter immediately. Why don't you reconsider your decision about teaching? No, Mustafa Hojam. I enjoy drawing the studies material for the school, but teaching is not my cup of tea. I like to dedicate myself to painting. I see, I see. Besides, you have Zara, and you work great together. Oh, there she is. All right, kids, come to the neighboring classroom. Boys and girls crowded the exit, and soon the classroom was quiet. The drawings, are, those drawings are marvelous, Kalakatan. They'll be of help, great help to us. Lo took to showing to illustrations to Zara, the teacher left for his study. But then there came a loud thud on the door. A man entered the chamber, stepping proudly. I'm guessing this is Noray's husband. His clothes hinted at his high rank, but Lo had never seen him before. He gave the girls a contentious look. One of you is Zara Katan, I presume? I guess it's you. Yes, my lord. And you are? I'm Yuvaz Pasha. Sultan Mariah put me in charge of putting culture and education in order. Well, there's a lot to do. Hmm. He gave Zara a look of barely disguised contempt. What can make a woman take up science? I guess if she failed in her primary purpose. If I recall correctly, you weren't very successful in the harem, so you became a teacher out of despair. And Marad put him in charge for what? Why do you keep putting stupid ass people like this in charge? Like, if you're okay with women being in the what's the name, then why would you put someone in charge like this, who's clearly just going to cause problems and try to push all the women out of it? It's like... I don't understand. Zara flushed, lowered her head, and rushed to the door. Excuse me, I got a lesson. The kids are waiting. Lo and the man were alone in the classroom. She turned to him, eyes ablaze with anger. What you just said was unjust and rude. Zara's been fascinated by science since she was a child. But seeing the tune her words out, his eyes were scanning Lel's face. He frowned, looking surprised and tense. Are you Aisha's daughter? Lel? Yes. That explains a lot. Your mother was the same. 
bold and stubborn. She did what she wanted. Your eyes look like hers, and you're even prettier. A woman's obstinacy can ruin any beauty. Remember that, girl. And don't repeat your mother's mistakes. A condescending smile appeared on his face. The man put his palm on top of Lil's. A flash and a vision appeared before her eyes. A young woman, pale, scared, crying. Lil recognized her mother right away. No, no. She was stumbling back and whispering, then almost screaming. Why are you doing this? It's not fair. Not fair. Another flash and Lil came back to reality and jerked her hand back at a rapid fire pace. His Pasha smiled smugly again and left the classroom. Right after that, teacher Mustafa walked in and looked at Lil worriedly. What's wrong, my dear? Did he offend you in any way? Oh, so you expected it? She remained silent, still looking at the door perplexedly. Yavuz Pasha is the worst thing that could happen to Ottoman education. Lil had been sitting in the abandoned house yard for the last two hours, tracing the canvas with cold tirelessly. Um, like, I know you like being here in this your kind of place now, but with Mehmet's mother kind of lingering around, well, I guess you don't know he's Mehmet's mother. But, I mean, you should have put clues together to figure out that it's Mehmet's mother. I'm going to say she's probably going to pop up here. The image was still pretty schematic, but the delicate features of her mother's face were already apparent. I can never remember her before. There was only a vague image in my head, indistinct, far away. But now I saw her so clearly, I'll make her a portrait and mom's face will always be with me. At first Diana tried to attract her attention, inviting her to play. But soon she realized Lil was busy, and now she was lying by her master's feet, looking bored. Aww. Suddenly the dog jumped to her feet and her ears perked up. She sniffed the air. There were footsteps over the fence and the dog ran there. Diana! The girl felt confused, not sure if she should chase the dog or hide. The bushes rustled louder. A male figure jumped out of them, grabbed the girl by her waist, and lifted her up. Dude, don't just be snatching people! Not okay! Is that- I think that outfit's new. Lil. He spun her around. I I almost died out of fear. Lil shook her fist at him the moment she was back on the ground, but he immediately rushed to give her a hug. What are you doing? Come on, stop suffocating me. I'm sorry, I can't. I've missed you too much. How long haven't we seen each other? Three months? Two and a half. Ooh. Lil turned around, spotting her second friend. Flat, you're back too. I am. He came closer and Lil wiggled her herself out of Asa's embrace and rushed to hug him. For several seconds, Flat was just standing there, watching her with his usual restraint. But then his hands rose and closed in on her back in a firm embrace. Yes, Lil, we've missed you very much. Diana was jumping around, chasing her own tail, not knowing how to express the joy of seeing her friends again. We're going back. Oh, thank goodness I survived. The past is so stressful. I hate everything back there. <laughs> Besides her relationship with like her friends back then, it's just like terrible. It's a terrible place to be. I woke up and immediately heard a delicate knock on the door. I rubbed my face to come to my senses and went to open the door. Am I interrupting something? No, it's fine. How was your visit? It's fine, Melody. If you're not busy, why don't we... Behind his back, there came a sound of shattering porcelain and ran out of the room. There was a broken vase lying in the middle of the hallway, and Valentine was standing next to it, holding three vases like that one. Each contained a small bouquet of yellow field flowers. Because he decided to carry all the vases at once, and one slipped. So I noticed Vlad looking at the flowers, too. His expression changed immediately. Valentine? What flowers are these? Vlad approached him in brisk steps and grasped one stem from a vase. This is not goat weed, it's goldenrod. He excelled on and gave Valentine a heavy look. Did you use it for the cover as well? Valentine went pale and nodded, frightened, muttering some explanation. But Vlad wasn't looking at him anymore, he was already running down the hallway. Oh no. Millie! He pushed the door to my sister's room, it was empty. Vlad, what's going on? Is Millie in danger? Yes. He ran further and I followed him. Vlad? Oh, that's the room he stopped me from going down. 
We ran through the dark corridors and staircases. Bly and I were going deeper into the underground part of the castle. I wanted to ask him what was going on, but I was out of breath, having run quickly and still fearing for my sister. At some point, we paused at a crossway and I recognized the spot. That's what the sounds I heard in the wall led me the last time. Suddenly, a roaring of stones came from one of the passages, as if a wall crumbled down. Millie. Sister? When I ran there, I saw Millie at the end of the passage. She was pressing her back against the wall, terrified, watching a dark silhouette approach her from the destroyed wall on the opposite side. A draft made the flame and one of the torches on the wall flicker, casting light on the figure. Is it finally here? Motherfucker! Bruh. Get the fuck out of here, dude! Oh my god! Ugh! Just die already! <laughs> Ooh. I can't stand them. I can't stand them. I can't stand them. I <laughs> I gotta stop. Locus? He called him that before. But I rushed toward them. I ran after him. Noah was standing motionless, watching us approach with an ominous smirk. But the moment we were a step away from him, Noah was gone. He literally disappeared into thin air like fog. <sighs> I hate him. I hate him so much. All right, the next one says the king steps on the stage. I don't know in particular which king they're referring to, but I guess we'll figure it out. No way is pathetic. Say it again. He's pathetic. I hate him. He should die in a fire. I right, stop. But, um, once again, the past is just a terrible place to be. I dread when she starts working on those paintings and gotta go back there because, um, it, it's just, it's just, it's too much. It, it's just too much. Too much stuff. You know, like, the situation is already bad. Like, it's too there's too many enemies popping out like you know what i mean like it was already enough like why they add new people it's like i don't know it's like Mehmet's not fully gone you know what i mean like why we gotta add this other stupid idiot like for real i don't know anyway um I enjoyed the Vlad in uh, the Vlad scenes this time. That was really nice too. Yeah, I feel like we're finally making some some headway here. I feel like she's putting some pieces together. Um, not so much in the past, but in, in the present. I feel like she's putting some pieces together. She's finally becoming part of the o bigger overarching story. Um. She's not completely there yet, but I can see her taking strides to finally becoming an actual character. And that's exciting. That's really exciting, too. So, yeah. So, overall, I, I enjoyed the episode. <sighs> yeah. We're fine. We're fine. <laughs> okay. Anyway, thank you guys so, so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, go ahead and show a like button, some love, subscribe to see more content like this, and I will see you next time. Bye!